All right, good morning, everybody. I hope you're all bright and fresh. I have the honor of giving the first talk of the last day. <laughs> um, so thank you for the introduction. My name is Amanda Prorock. Uh, I'm from the University of Cambridge. And what I work on is multi-robot and multi-agent systems. Uh, my goal for the tutorial today is, first of all, to introduce it, you to this community of research and also to talk a little bit about why machine learning is gaining a lot of traction within this field, what kind of problems we're trying to tackle, and why machine learning is such a promising approach to solving these problems. So my interests are really driven by this idea that the next wave of computing is about devices that communicate and coordinate. And this interest or this drive is really backed up by the prediction that by 2035, there are going to be over a trillion devices worldwide that are connected. And these connections really mean that the, dis the, the decision making that autonomous agents are making is going to be in some way or another connected to the communication they have amongst other autonomous devices um, and the coordination that they want to achieve. And so we're really interested in understanding how we can bring that all together to get the devices to solve higher order problems in a joint um, co cooperative collaborative way. So um, what's my mission? Well, my mission is to understand how to uh, endow these autonomous agents that are connected to large groups of other autonomous agents with intelligence that enables them to do things as a group in unison. So today, what am I going to talk about? So first of all, I'm going to talk a little bit about this idea of collective intelligence. And once that um, um, is done, I will move on to a little bit more of the foundations of what we do in three different parts. So I'm first going to introduce you to multi-agent and multi-robot problems and describe to you why they are hard. Um, in the second part of the talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about the paradigms, the machine learning paradigms that we use to solve these kinds of problems. And in the third part of my talk, I'm going to talk about the frontier of research, the state of the art as it's now, and what are the really, really hard problems that we still haven't really cracked yet. OK, so to begin. So what is collective intelligence, right? So what you see here is a swarm of starling birds um, flying in this extremely elegant formation. It looks, I don't know what adjectives you would actually think of to describe this, but I think of elegant, natural, robust, resilient. Um, you can think of, well, what happens if one bird remo is removed from the flock or a bunch of birds are added to the flock? Nothing really changes. These systems are extremely robust to those um, small uh, modifications that you would make to the system. It's decentralized. There is no apparent leader. There are no collisions, neither with birds nor with obstacles. So you can see there's a lot going on under the hood here, which um, is apparently incredibly complex, but perhaps very simple. Now, the interesting thing to us, so researchers in the area of collective intelligence, is this kind of behavior, at least with, say, robots, we haven't quite understood or we haven't quite achieved um, reproducing this with engineered systems for many different reasons. There are clearly some mechatronic reasons, but there are also algorithmic reasons why generating this kind of collective intelligence is hard. So. While this is very beautiful, you might be asking yourself, well, how, how is this even practical? Why would we want to understand to generate collective intelligence that has these properties? Well, here are a couple of reasons. Collective intelligence is the source of a lot of knowledge, which we can apply to very specific application domains. Um, if you think about multi-robot systems, where every single robot is an individual that you actually care about, um, you can apply these kind of systems to for example, logistics, warehouse, warehouse automation. So those of you who are familiar with Amazon or Ocado in the UK um, will know that they operate their warehouses with autonomous robots. These are multi-agent systems. And the coordination that happens in these warehouses is incredibly sophisticated because as Amazon gets orders in, that order is immediately piped through the, to the warehouses and the robots basically go try to avoid each other, try to plan efficient paths to retrieve items, bring them to the packers, and so on and so forth, because time optimization is really, really critical in those problems, right? So, so solving the problem of what has to go um, to, what has to be packed into a box to getting the robots to actually physically enact that is a complicated coordination problem. 
Um, Ocado has these systems where they actually do bin packing from the top, but there's also a lot of coordination going on there. Lots of interesting movies on YouTube on how they do it. Um, and then there's also applications in transport where people are thinking about getting um, trucks to drive in platoons um, for many reasons. One is um, it minimizes the stress on truck drivers, um, and also it is drag efficient, so you're optimizing energy and fuel consumption. Agriculture, trying to optimize the connection between, well, how is the soil doing? How is the crop doing? What are our sensors telling us to how are we actually deploying um, the, the planting process, the farming process? Um, and these things are distributed, spatially distributed problems. So it makes absolute sense to use spatially distributed autonomous systems to solve them. There are a couple more applications that are a little bit more out there, but um, we, see the, we see these um, coming closer to fruition. So environmental monitoring with autonomous systems where people cannot access the areas or should not access the areas to disturb them less. Uh, surveillance systems, autonomous construction, or deploying robots into space, right? So commonly you think of the three Ds when you think about robotics, right? It's either dull, dangerous, or dirty. Um, and that applies to many of these applications. So moving on to solving the problems um, so that we actually get to the applications. Um, that's an interesting question because many of these multi-agent problems are actually really hard. And I'm going to try to convince you of why they are hard in the next few minutes. Um, so to talk about that, I'll, I'll introduce you to the three C's. Uh, so coordination, collaboration, coordination, and why they're different. Um, I'll talk about centralized versus decentra decentralized systems. And we're also going to think a little bit about how, how do we actually deal with failures. So to get things started, I'm going to play this movie. And I want you to pay um, attention here because I will ask you a question at the end of the movie. So the EPUC robots are about this big. So tabletop sized um, little autonomous robots. Here they're mo moving on the floor on a two dimensional workspace. And they come together and they form the logo of EPFL, which is the university where this was filmed at. All right, so this is a problem of coordination, clearly. Anybody have any idea how this was solved? No, no answer is a wrong answer. Anybody venture a guess? Yes, there's a guess over there. Waiting for the mic. Um, well, every, every robot, well, this is kind of like swarm robotics, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so every robot connects to every other. So they're sending information to each, like to everyone mm -hmm. at the same time. I'm not really sure how they do the coordination for the actual logo. Um, mm -hmm. And also, I'm not sure if the movement is, um, well, if it's vibrations, because there's, there's another model of Swarm Robotics, but that only uses vibrations. So I think in that case, it's just sending information to the coordinates where it should vibrate to. Um, but yeah, like I think it's just communication between all the individuals in the in the environment. Okay. Do you know how it would scale if everybody would be talking to anybody? Excellent question. Uh, I'm not sure. I, I did read into it, but I didn't get into more. Like, so yeah. the, quite, the answer is it doesn't really square, scale. So you would have at least n square. You have n square uh, uh, complexity in terms of comms here if you have an everybody to everybody um, system. And for tiny little robots like that, which run on like 270 something megabytes of memory, very, very low bandwidth comms, it's, it's not really a workable solution beyond, say, 10, 20 robots. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, you could think of doing it like that if you want to do it in a decentralized way. Anybody else have a guess? Yeah? Yeah, a very easy solution could just be to pre-program everyone's individual trajectory mm -hmm. and make it look very random in the beginning, mm -hmm. but yes. Yeah, so a centralized system, you could do that. So the whole, you know exactly where the robots are located at the beginning, you pre-plan the whole routes. Um, it's a, what we call a labeled assignment problem. Every robot has to go to a specific location in space. Um, you use some powerful computer to compute all the trajectories. You know that they're collision-free. You know that the robots end in their precise positions. 
You could do that, but then you have one solution for one layout, right? And then if you remove a robot, add a robot, there's no robustness. Um, and, and, and in that case, um, you'd have to pre-compute another solution again uh, or find some real-time um, add-ons to, to help with that. So, okay. At the time we filmed this, there is another idea. Okay, let's have another idea. Hi, not quite an idea, more so a question. Something you just said about uh, robots being pre-labeled and then having a pr uh, set yeah. trajectory. Is there any way that you could do any kind of like PCA for large scale, like classification in that sense? Classification? Uh, I'm not quite sure. Uh, like uh, some kind, if you are pre-labeling the robots, yeah. is there any way you can do like principal, principal component analysis to kind of minimize the dimension, like how many robots there are at scale? So the, the thing here is that every single robot counts. So you have to find a solution, a trajectory for every single robot. So um, compacting the dimensionality of the problem here probably won't help because you, at the end of the day, you have to generate a solution for every individual. Um, so, I was a PhD student when this video was filmed. That was about, yeah, 20, 2014, 2013-ish. Um, we did not have a solution to this problem, and we still don't. This is actually a really hard problem. And so, the way we actually did this movie is, given that I'm telling you now there wasn't a solution to this, and still really isn't a good solution to this. Not video editing. Some really smart video editing, yeah. We actually place the robots in the logo and we're playing the video backwards. Okay, so this is just to show you, we wanted to do this video, but we didn't have a solution to do it. Um, I was actually one of the lucky PhD students standing around there catching the robots after they had dispersed to put them back into place. Um, yeah, anyway, this is showing you that this kind of problem is actually really hard. There's a lot of, um, so one of the things that is hard is not only finding out which robot you want to send where, but then computing the trajectory plans that actually allow the robot to get there without ending up in a deadlock or a live lock, which basically means a place, you know, a place, um, one robot might have consumed its place on the outer rim of a logo and another robot has to reach a place in the inner side of the logo, right? So these kind of um, trajectory coordination problems um, are hard. And so you have to treat the couple, the system as a coupled system where you're jointly optimizing all the trajectories as one system. And that's why the complexity, that's where the complexity of the problem comes from. Okay, so that was a bit of an intro. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the difference of coordination, cooperation, and collaboration. Because it's not, many people use these words interchangeably, but within our community, there is actually a difference. So coordination for us is when we get different agents to work together and there is an, a, at most a linear gain in performance when you get the robots to work together. So you can think about coverage, for example. If you want to distribute a set of robots into space, um, you're at most get a, going to get a linear gain the more robots you add to that system because you're just covering the space quicker, but it's no more than a linear gain in performance, right? You, you have 10 robots more, you're, 10, you're going to add that increment um, uh, in terms of time efficiency. Cooperation is a little bit more intricate because we can achieve super linear gains, but there often is a threshold in the system. So you often have to have at least X agents that cooperate to really achieve that performance boost. So it's not no longer um, an incremental performance ga gain, but now there's a threshold in the system. There's a jump that you will um, um, go through when you're trying to achieve something. The example we have there is, for example, you have, again, um, a type of coverage problem, but here you're actually searching for a target and you have to relay that information back to some base station. Well, the relay of information back to the base station will only work if you have enough robots actually creating a connected communication path back to the base station. And the robots have to align themselves in a way so that this communication path is actually generated, okay? So it's, it's an all or nothing, and if I, if I now add more robots to that communication path, you don't gain very much anymore. But there is a jump in performance once you created that connection to the base station. And the final one is collaboration, and that really comes in when the robots have different capabilities. So complementary skills. So you can think of ground robots and drones or different types of agents with 
complementary, distinct capabilities, and they work together to solve problems that can't be solved with just one type of robot, right? So you can think about when you write papers, you collaborate with other people who have different sets of skills. And that's where collaboration comes from. You're, you're, you're coming together, bringing together a bigger pot of, of capabilities because you're different. Okay, so those are three different kinds of um, uh, uh, cooperation or coordination mechanisms, and I'm gonna talk a little bit through a few of them. So, Multi-agent pathfinding um, generally is classified as a, as a problem of coordination. And uh, what does it consist of, this problem? So it is one of the biggest problems within the community of multi-agent uh, research. And it's been extremely extensively researched because this is the core to any problem. This is the core solution to any problem that requires agents to move in a joint state space where you're trying to optimize for some optimality metrics, say flow time or make span, where you want either the sum of the travel times to be minimum or the time of the slowest robot to be minimum, right? And what does it consist of? Well, basically you have agents that start at given locations and they have predefined goal locations. So every agent knows it has to go to a specific um, point in space. So this is called a labeled um, uh, uh, pathfinding problem. And the task of the robots is to find collision-free collision -free paths for all the agents from their start to the goal locations that optimize some objectives. So clearly, we're not only trying to solve the problem, i.e., we want completeness, right? But we also want to be very efficient, so we want to be quick. Um, and completeness is actually important here because there are many scenarios where you can imagine there are layouts um, of the workspaces, which mean that robots might, might get into each other's way, and they get into each other's way in a, in, 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 in a manner that doesn't allow them to reach their goals anymore. And that is the worst case scenario, because imagine you're in an, a warehouse situation where you have to deliver goods, and robots get stuck. Um, and then you actually physically have to go in and unstick them. So what do I mean by that? Um, so let's have a look and um, juxtapose coupled versus uncoupled systems. So here we have a layout on uh, the left-hand side where you have the, uh, a green robot that wants to reach its green goal and a blue robot that wants to reach its blue goal. In an uncoupled, decentralized system, if they both start moving at the same time, the green robot might get going and then the blue robot will quickly find out, oops, I cannot get to my goal, I'm stuck. So this is a deadlock situation, right? And this is... Um, basically the kiss of death for any, um, any solution that's trying to deploy multi-agent pathfinding um, in order to, say, distribute uh, goods or, or, or collect goods from, from destinations, because you're stuck, right? Now, how do we get around that? We get around that by modeling the system as a coupled system. And what happens when we model the system in a coupled way is you're now planning in the joint state space. And because you're planning in the joint state space, the green robot knows it cannot move before the blue robot moved. Because it knows that if it moves, the blue, there, is no, there is no node, search node solution, there's no leaf node in your search tree that consists of a valid path for all the robots that lead them to their goals, okay? And so if you're planning in the coupled state space, you can achieve completeness because the blue robot will move before the green one comes and consumes its place, okay? So what is the problem with coupled planning, right? So at this point, you might be thinking, oh, great. Well, let's just use coupled planning all the time. So the problem with coupled planning is complexity. So if we take this, if we tease this problem apart and analyze it, um, what, are, what are we looking at here? So let's think of each robot as planning its, um, in its own configura uh, configuration space. If we're now coupling the system, um, what we end up with is a system where we have m to the power of n states, right? m is the number of states in a single robot's configuration space, and n is the number of robots. Um, so now we have m to the power of n states in our coupled system, and we now have to use a classical search algorithm to search over these states to find a valid leaf node, right, which has a path for all the robots. So if we think of, for example, A star, which I presume most of you are familiar with. Who's familiar with A star? OK. Um, so the complexity of A star roughly will be in the order of, so the worst case complexity will be um, uh, m to the power of n. And you can see here that the number of robots, which is the exponent here, um, is, it's in the exponent of our worst case complexity, which means that as we scale 
the system in the number of robots, we're increasingly finding it difficult to compute tractable solutions, okay? So if you're, just um, a quick side note, um, you're, if you're trying to solve this kind of problem with ASTAR with say 30 robots in a relatively cluttered workspace, you're already timing out at about 10 minutes compute time, okay? So you can't solve them anymore on a conventional computer. So this is the kind of problem you have to deal with if you're trying to solve multi-agent pathfinding. And as you know, clearly 20, 30 robots doesn't uh, make the cut. Many of these systems, especially if you look at logistics and warehouse systems, they're running with thousands of robots. So we need much more efficient solutions that can do this for us. Okay, then you might think and say, yeah, question. One question about this complexity. Um, sometimes this, um, this exponential complexity arises because uh, of the conditions. And I guess, I'm not sure if this is the case here. Um, what, if you accept suicide or if you accept sacrifice um, at a low rate, would that decrease the, uh, the complexity? So sacrifice as in robots? Or? Like you can, could say a robot which is not carrying anything, if it bumps into another robot, okay, it's a, it's a loss. Uh, it could be acceptable. So Problem, with a certain rate. Yeah, the problem in most of these systems is that we cannot sacrifice because a robot is a physical element in the system. It can't just be stuck in the workspace because then you have to model it as an obstacle. So there's no way you can not include it somehow in, in the problem because it, it's physically there. Um, and and if you ha if, especially if you're doing item retrieval, um, every item has to be retrieved. Right? Every, and once an item is retrieved, it has to be delivered. So you can't just like think it away. So there's not a lot of slack in that sense here. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know if that's what you were thinking of. I, I, I wonder, theoretically, even, I mean, sometimes just accepting a small yeah. rate, which is... So there are algorithms. So yes, um, so maybe um, answering the question a little differently, it's not in terms of sacrificing the robots, but more in, in terms of sacrifices of optimality. And yes, algorithms for that exist, and I will actually briefly mention them. And you can definitely do that, and that's clearly how people are doing it these days, because you use these heuristic solvers because optimal planners often don't make the cut in terms of uh, computational um, efficiency. But yes, yeah. Um, yeah, so, so you could also think about modeling the system. So these kind of complexities, they're only valid when you treat these systems with a centralized point of view, right? So you could then say, well, let's try to somehow um, decentralize them, maybe at the cost of, 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 of a performance hit, but what can you do in terms of a decentralized system? Well, a decentralized system, well, in that case, you might say, I'm modeling it as a partially observable, say, market decision process where there's also some randomness. But even if you think about it within these theoretical terms, we still have an intractable complexity here. So if we look at results um, that have been published, um, oh, I, I skipped a slide, actually. I'm already talking about this. So let me just quickly say here, if you, if you look at it from a centralized perspective, um, we know that it's NP-hard to solve optimally for, for both optimization objectives you'd, you'd be considering, which are make span as well as flow time. Um, and yes, um, back to your answer, there is a lot of um, research on approximate solutions, including elements, um, say, heuristic um, um, solvers, or just um, with, you can solve these things with given suboptimality guarantees, which is clearly um, really interesting because you want to know by how much you're going to be um, suboptimal with respect to the quickest you could do. Um, so there is a bit of research in that, and that's um, um, a very active domain, basically. Um, so as I was mentioning before, you could also model it differently as a decentralized, partially observable system where every agent is locally trying to make a decision for itself within a sequential decision-making um, uh, frame or formulation of the problem. But again, here we have hardness results. So um, Simply solving a partially observable MDP is known to be p-space hard, and there are also proofs um, saying that this is the decentralized version of it is next p-complete for anything larger than three agents. Um, this basically means that also decentralizing the solution yet trying to find optimality is very hard. Okay, so that gives you a flavor on the coordination side of things. Now I want to talk a little bit about cooperation. So what do I mean by cooperation? And I want to introduce this with um, a little video here. Um, so what you see happening here is um, 
uh, miniature highways. So this is some work that we did in my lab um, a few years back. And we wanted to model what happens to traffic systems when um, vehicles are driven with egocentric driver models. So no cooperation, basically, right? So every driver is in the car, wants to get home as quickly as possible. Um, and we created this interesting scenario in, 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 in our highway, which basically had one of the cars break down. And we wanted to observe what happens organically. And what happens is that we have um, the situation where the cars start queuing behind the bottleneck. And they start queuing behind the bottleneck because the cars that are already on the outer lane kind of think, well, good for me. I'm just going to continue at my current speed. And the cars on the inner lane have no space, um, no safe interval within which they can safely maneuver their way out into the outer lane. Okay? So there is no cooperation here. And throughput in the system is clearly not ideal. Okay? So we thought, OK, what can we do to introduce cooperation into this scheme? Well, one thing we can do is to get the robots, so the robots here, to talk to each other. And simply by talking to each other, they're communicating their local incentives, but they're also communicating a global objective and trying to optimize their local decision making with respect to this higher order goal, which in this case is optimizing the throughput of the system as a whole. Okay? And what you can see happening here is super subtle, but you saw it happen, and I'm just going to play um, the movie again. If you see what happens to the cars on the outer lane, they slow down just ever so slightly to make space for the cars on the inner lane to safely maneuver out onto the outer lane. You can see the maneuvers happening, and the slowdown is very subtle. So you can see here, by taking a very subtle hit in your own local incentive, which is, I want to get home as quickly as possible, you're actually making a significant difference to the system as a whole. Okay? Now, the problem with this is that cooperation strategy was hand-designed um, with a lot of self-thought self through heuristics. Um, and clearly, the goal here, when we try to solve these kinds of cooperation problems, is not to hand-design a solution for every new given problem, but to find some sort of way of generating solutions in a more automated way. And that actually will lead to a couple of things that I'm going to be talking about in the machine learning section of, of the seminar. Now, the final um, um, example I want to show you is one that exemplifies collaboration. And um, I just want to show you this movie because it's, it's one of the most beautiful examples, I think, of a collaborative multi-robot system. And I just want you to, to watch it whilst you perhaps guess what's, what's going to happen at the end of this. In this particular situation, um, there's probably little machine learning in here. So per perhaps some of the controls, but the coordination itself is not machine learned. So this is um, part of the solution is, uh, uh, is based on not theory. Yeah. So it's a simple system. We only have two robots, which is probably why we didn't have to apply um, more sophisticated solvers. But it's a very good example of collaboration, because the two robots need each other to build uh, this bridge, right? And you can think of, as soon as you start scaling these ideas of wanting to build construction with much larger number of robots, it again becomes a problem of combinatorial search, because you're trying to coordinate many different robots along their trajectories um, with respect to some higher order structure or ideal that you want to solve. Okay? So this problem of combinatorics is really um, underlying a lot of the challenges we're trying to solve within the multi-agent domain. OK, so now this leads me to the core problem and the heart of the research of um, the multi-robot or multi-agent domain, which basically relies on, or on three main pillars. So first of all, um, I've convinced you of the hardness of decision, of coordinated decision making. And there are hardness proofs that corroborate this. Um, if we want to decentralize our solutions to get rid of the coupled centralized component, 
which is uh, the reason we're dealing with the combinatorics, then the question becomes, well, if I decentralize my system, I have to know what the robots have to communicate to each other. And hand designing what the robots have to communicate with each other is, again, a difficult design problem for which there are, again, no, uh, it's very difficult to, to devise the, the answers from scratch with hand design strategies. Um, and there are also uh, results that demonstrate why it is hard, again, to design these communication strategies from scratch. And the third reason that solving multi-robot problems is hard is even if we have a system um, that works, and even if we have a solution that can potentially scale, what happens if anything in the system breaks? What happens if communication is not reliable? If there are delays? Uh, what happens if one of the robots breaks? Pre-planned solutions um, will, are not able to deal with this. And so we need much more resilient, robust solutions that can solve hard problems, but are also robust to noise, default, uh, faults, and delays. And so this is why, altogether, um, the community as a whole has been gradually, but very securely, moving away from first principles-based approaches to more data-driven solutions that promise um, uh, to give us a little bit more robustness in the face of some of these challenges. OK, and so this is a little bit what I'm going to talk about in the next two remaining bits of, of this tutorial. So there are a couple of machines. So you've seen a lot of different machine learning paradigms in the summer school. And um, within um, the realm of multi-agent and multi-robot planning, um, there are two paradigms um, that stand out, so imitation learning and reinforcement learning. And I'm going to give you examples of how we deploy these two paradigms to solve a couple of our problems. So I'm going to start a little bit with imitation learning. So um, the assumption that we make when we deploy imitation learning to solve hard problems is that an expert algorithm exists. Okay? But we know for many of the problems that we have expert algorithms. It's just that our expert algorithms do not scale, and it's just that our expert algorithms are not very good at dealing with, with failures. But perhaps we can still leverage them to learn initial solutions and then take them a step farther. So that is the hope that we have when we're using imitation learning as the beginning um, or as the paradigm um, with which we're trying to generate more powerful solutions. The other idea that has been around for um, a short while is this idea of using reinforcement learning. And reinforcement learning is really interesting in cases when we don't have an expert um, or where we don't know what the optimal behavior even looks like. So for some of the problems I introduced to you before, we don't know. We don't have an optimization objective that we can um, throw into some solver and then generate a solution for a small scale system. Hence, we leverage machine, uh, reinforcement learning systems where we know how to design an instantaneous reward that eventually will lead to a desirable behavior, but we don't have the objective we're, we're trying to um, um, uh, uh, solve at the end of the day. Um, the problem with reinforcement learning is clearly that we need to do reward shaping. And reward shaping is a bit of an art. Um, there is little theory that can really guide us there. And so it, it tends to be quite challenging as well for those reasons. Um, and so the additional challenges that we deal with when we combine re either reinforcement learning or imitation learning um, with the problems that we have in our domain is that, well, we have to base our decision making mostly on only local observations, because that's what agents and robots often um, are, are given. And um, we have, and especially in the cases when we're only basing our systems on local observations, we have to know how to communicate amongst other agents. Okay? So the inter-agent communication has to be either designed or learned. So what are the questions that we, we ask ourselves here? So one of the things we're interested in is, um, can our agents learn to interact? And especially, can our agents learn to communicate with one another? So what is it, what is contained in the messages that the robots are sending each other? Um, and based on this, are the robots going to be make, able to make local decisions that will lead to the performance that we want to achieve in the system as a whole? Okay? So the, the decisions that the agents are going to be making are going to be based on what they see within their local vicinity, as well as what they're getting as messages from their neighboring robots. So why do we think that imitation learning is such a good idea? So I think that this um, plot here really nicely um, represents that. So we know that we have, for very small problems, we have offline optimal solutions. So for example, um, any of the A star is an 
optimal algorithm that works very well for small scale systems. Um, and there are many similar search algorithms that have been developed to solve difficult combinatorial problems in, in, in the small um, scale regime. Um, we also know how to solve smallish systems when we only have partial information about what the system is doing as a whole. So those are the solutions that leverage ideas and theory from the POMDP um, area of literature. Um, we also know roughly what to do when we want approximately uh, optimal solutions in the large scale regime. But we don't really have solution, uh, we don't have really a way of how to leverage those solutions when we move on to into the uh, local regime, decentralized regime with partially um, observable information about what the system is, is, is assumed to know. Okay? So this is the regime we're interested in solving. But we have solutions in the other three boxes. And so by leveraging imitation learning, we can use experts from any one of those white boxes there, try to copy them, and then try to generalize out to this box here, which is ultimately what we're interested in, to provide a solution for this kind of holy grail area or zone, which is fully scalable, fully online, large scale, um, decentralized, based on local observations and communication between agents only. So this is the idea that really underlies why we're using or why we're hoping that um, imitation learning can help us achieve this. So clearly, the answer lies in those red, um, orange arrows there. And this is a very active domain in research. And we don't necessarily um, have this all figured out just yet. Yep, there's a question. Um, can you hear me? Yes. So I happen to be working in the exact same space. Mm -hmm. One of the challenges that I face specifically is like, usually imitation learning tends to be, like the expert tends to be a human imitation from which we can probably all agree that probably like the, that's probably not the optimal solution. Yeah. Um, also, if we are actually, a lot of these problems uh, boil down to an idea of discretization from which uh, your optimality may lie in between in between resolution. So is there any way or like from, okay, maybe why should we actually look into imitation learning? Why should we, who, which expert should we actually use and like mm -hmm. why? Yeah, thank you for the question. So the question is which expert should we use? Why should we use it? Yeah. I agree with like, sorry. I agree with the fact that imitation learning is a initial great solution. But so for many systems, we actually know. Um, so I'm going to give you one very concrete example um, right after this. And for many of the systems we're trying to solve, say you're trying to solve the multi-agent pathfinding problem, we, we have a selection of optimal solvers for that. Um, and we can just select one of those expert solvers. It doesn't really matter which one. Because what we're going to be doing is then leveraging the data that those expert solvers produce us, which are optimal solutions to originally you know, defined problems, so problem instances, um, and base, try to learn, a, to distill a pattern from what those experts are telling us, you, how to move from um, a problem instance to a solution. So clearly, that is not enough. Because if we just copy that, we're not doing anything more than our expert solvers can do besides perhaps solving them a little bit quicker because we're just running inference instead of actually solving the full computational problem. But the holy grail here lies in finding a way or tr um, designing an architecture or a learning paradigm that allows us to generalize. Generalize beyond the, the size of the instances that were saw, seen at training time. And that is really, if you can achieve that, that is really when, you get it, when it gets interesting because Essentially, what I'm saying here is if you're able to train on small instances, which are technically NP hard to solve, but then you're generalizing to much larger ones with um, uh, a model that is just running inference, what, I'm, what you're essentially doing in that case is that you're running inference on an NP hard problem and solving it, which would be amazing, right? Um, but that is, is, there's a lot of questions and, and challenges along the way because the, this process of generalizing to harder and bigger problems is not trivial. And understanding what we have to do in order to train our systems so that they do that, or with very little performance hit, is, is, is the research challenge. And I will get back to that with, with an example. Um, so what are we going to do? So one way we're going to tackle this problem of 
trying to understand how to teach robots to interact with, with each other and learn how to solve these difficult coordination problems is to model the system as a graph, right? So this is our proxy. We're, we're looking at agent-to-agent -agent relationships as graphical structures. And we're going to exploit this graphical structure to this, this graphical idea to structure the underlying data, um, implicitly giving the system an inductive bias, which will help us to then bring, um, uh, bring in machine learning solutions um, to our problem. So the inductive bias that we're going to use in our system are graph neural networks. And I know there's going to be a talk about this um, right following up. So I'm not going to go into too much depth um, on, on GNNs, apart from the fact that they are the workhorse for many multi-agent and multi-robot problems because of the natural resemblance of our systems to graphs. Okay? So why are graph neural networks so interesting um, as, a, as a tool for, for multi-robot and multi-agent problems? Well, first of all, they provide us with the right inductive bias, um, and they have several other really interesting properties. One of them is that they're permutation equivariant. What does that mean? That means that basically I can get, be getting information from, say, neighboring robots, and it's order independent. It doesn't matter how this information is organized. The decision I will be making, assuming that the state of the robots is the same, is always the same. So that's this permutation equivariance um, um, property. We also have stability, which is a slightly more subtle definition here. Um, but, but that basically means that if the topologies within which the robots are acting look roughly similar, my actions are also going to be roughly similar, right? And so that's a really interesting property um, to have in addition to the permutation equivariance. And finally, and this is the most interesting bit, graph neural networks, the way we formalize them, are intrinsically decentralizable. Although you can formulate them in a centralized way and you can use the centralized formulation for very efficient training schemes, so centralized training, at runtime, you can deploy them locally on the robots in a completely partially observable um, setting. And that's why we're so excited about using them, because training is efficient, and running them at execution time is realistic and practicable. All right, first hands-on example. All right, so what we're doing here is we're going to be solving the multi-agent pathfinding problem. So as you know from what I've talked about in the previous few minutes, this problem is here, here is NP hard to solve. There exist a couple of um, solvers that can do this, but they're all based on search. Um, so search with optimality and completeness guarantees. So what are we going to try to do here? We're going to try to synthesize local decision-making policies that also use communication between the agents to solve this multi-agent pathfinding problem as well as our expert solvers do. Okay, So quite an ambitious aim because we're not only um, trying to do better and quicker than centralized solvers, but we're also going to try to do that in a decentralized scheme where we don't have global observability of the playing field, right? And this global observability of the playing field tends to be quite critical because you need to know where other robots are heading in order to really plan your best possible, possible paths around their future paths, right? OK, so um, this is a bit of a giveaway. This is already our solution running, but I'm going to show you how we get there. So we're going to use um, this um, um, setup of things. So we have an agent that has a starting position. We have an agent that uh, each agent has a goal position. Because the agents only have local observability, they only see what's in their um, field of view. So they don't even know exactly where they're heading. Their final um, position is only projected on the uh, perimeter of this local field of view. And, um, and now they're going to be interacting with other agents that uh, enter their local field of view and, as, and the obstacles as well, trying to avoid them whilst consistently navigating towards their goal. Key thing here is that we want the paths to be optimal or as close as possible to optimal as, um, as we can do. And we don't want the agents to end up in deadlocks or live locks because that would break um, um, the system, right? OK, um, what we're going to be exploiting in addition to this local field of view is communication. So agents can send each other messages. And this is really critical because this is the only way that agents can locally aggregate a, some idea of what is going on in the field as a whole, right? Because this agent is aggregating information from its neighborhood, and those robots will have aggregated information from their neighborhoods. So you can already see here how, if we use a smart machine learning paradigm locally, you're piecing together an image of what everybody is doing. But clearly, first principles methods are difficult to design here. And that is why we're going to employ um, a machine learning uh, based paradigm to do this for us. 
So how do we set up our pipeline? So we have on the left-hand side our local observation, which is what every agent is seeing. This uh, local observation um, um, is basically consisting of um, my position or where I lied, the other agent's positions, and the goal projection. That information is then locally encoded um, by CNN. Um, um, and that information is then passed on to my graph neural net, which basically emulates the communication um, by computing how information is sent and, um, and received among agents. Okay? And the output of the GNN is then passed into a sequence of fully connected layers, and the robot's motion decision is then um, a simple final softmax over our discrete motion primitives in the system. Right? So the robots, in this um, particular example, moving, are moving on a grid plane, so they have to decide between up, down, left, or right, or idle. And that's why um, we use this, um, this scheme. Okay, so this is our pipeline, right? Processing of my local field of view, deciding how I want to encode that information to send to my neighboring robots. I'm a receiving robot, I process that information, and then I base that, um, I use that information to decide how I locally am going to act, okay? Right, so there are only two slides of maths in my whole presentation, and this is one of them. Um, so I just want to talk you through how we actually compose the system and how we write it down in centralized form. Okay? Um, and this allows us to train the systems very efficiently. So overall, it actually is very simple. right? So S here is my adjacency matrix. My adjacency matrix tells me how my robots are connected to each other. So who can talk to who based on some maximum communication range, for example, or it could be some other constraint. But we're assuming that there is some sort of um, limitation here that not everybody's connected to everybody at any given time. Um, X here is a matrix that is um, aggregating all the local features from all the different robots. So X would be the feature of, uh, X sub J would be the feature of robot J. Um, and what we see on the first line here is basically the, the equation that describes to us how any given robot I is aggregating information from its local neighborhood, right? Because the adjacency matrix, for those of you um, who are not familiar with that concept, is basically a matrix of zeros and ones, right? So if you're connected to another robot, you're going to be uh, including that information. Um, and if you're not, you don't include that information. And then K here, the second sum here, the outer sum that I'm producing, is over communication hops, right? If I only have a one hop communication um, scheme, then I'm just talking to my nearest neighbors, and um, K is equal to one. What I do in my second equation here is then add the machine learning component here. I'm going to be right multiplying all of this with a matrix H, which is uh, simply going to be my learnable parameter, right? So this matrix is just telling me how I should aggregate information that is coming in from my local neighborhood. Okay? And then you can add this matrix here for as many hops as you want as a function of how your real practical system is implemented. In a one-hop system, you only have one matrix H, otherwise you have a bank of matrices, okay? And so I can represent this uh, short script with uh, this function G, that's my communication function, parameterized by theta sub two, which is basically my, ma my bank of matrices H. And then I can do that for all the, the different components that I had in my machine learning pipeline for my CNN, my GNN, and my MLP. And I'm learning these three sets of parameters. And the loss function I'm going to be using here is a cross-entropy loss, because you remembered that I'm actually dealing with discrete motion primitives, um, which is practical for this particular scenario, um, and, uh, but a wise choice to make in terms of uh, my loss function. And then I minimize that uh, loss function over um, um, data that I'm given through my expert solver. Okay? So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to convince you how I can actually use this graph neural network in a decentralized setting. So this would be my centralized way of formulating it, how I train my systems at, um, during, um, during train time when I actually have global information available to me. But at runtime, I don't. At runtime, I don't have an adjacency matrix. At runtime, I don't have global observability. I don't have an expert solver. So how does this actually roll out? Okay. So let's have a look at this um, graphic here where you can see how robot A, um, which is at the center of the system, is getting information from its local um, neighborhood. So each robot here is taking its local field of view, encoding that local field of view, producing um, this local feature vector x sub a, x sub b, x sub c for each robot. And that local feature um, vector is what it's going to be communicating to its local neighborhood. right? 
Now, if I look at um, uh, a robot B here, you can see how that is exemplified, right? So I have my multi-channel input goes in through my uh, CNN, and that generates this X sub B vector. Now, we're going to focus on robot A. Robot A is going to be getting three pieces of information because it's connected to three different robots within its one um, um, hop communication neighborhood. So what does this look like? Well, you'll remember from my centralized training scheme that all I learned was basically this um, set of, oh yeah, it moved, good. This set of, of matrices, this bank of matrices H, right? That was trained at train time. And now I, if I'm robot A, I carry that matrix H on me. And so what I'm gonna be doing now is I'm gonna be multiplying my local feature vector X sub A with that matrix. But I'm also going to be receiving messages from my one hop communication neighbor, um, neighborhood, which is um, robots B and C. So I'm going to be summing those feature vectors, also multiplying them by my matrix H, this time from the first, the one hop communication neighborhood, then summing up those um, outputs, passing them through a nonlinearity, which produces my XA prime, and then passing that through my MLP, which produces my local decision, which is, should I move up, down, left, or right? And, and it's really as simple as that. So now you can see how, if I'm acting in a local, partially observable frame, if I know what my matrices H are, I'm already ex um, employing a graph neural network here to decide how I'm, how I'm receiving information, how I'm processing it, as well as what I'm going to be sending out, because it was trained in a pipeline. And so this turns out to be a really powerful paradigm. So what I'm showing you in this movie here is on the left-hand side, our expert solver, which we use to generate our data. And on the right-hand side, our network, which is running locally on every single agent here in a completely decentralized framework, right? And what's really amazing is that we're acting in a decentralized regime here. We don't have global information, but qualitatively, you can see that the agents roughly get to the goals at the same time, right? So both solvers here are solving the same problem but we only have partially observable um, information here, whereas the, the expert here is using, um, ev it has everything it needs to know from the get-go and is computing everything offline. So it's not really an apples to apples comparison here, and yet we're performing really, really well. The lines here, just for explanation, are the communication hops. So red is the one hop and um, the dashed one is the two hop communication. And it just shows you, if we focus on one agent, what is the information that that agent is, in, is aggregating whilst it's moving and making its decision in this sequential decision-making process. And you can see how the agents then reach their goals, right? So again, this here, since we're just running inference, you can scale this up arbitrarily because it's happening locally on the robots. So, so we're scaling with O of N, uh, O of 1, right? Which is the beauty of running systems in this way. And the expert solver, so in that particular case, we use an algorithm that's called CBS. It times out at 10 minutes for something around 40 to 45 agents. Um, and, and, and that is why we're so interested or excited about using um, policies and inference to solve these kinds of problems, with, which, which then um, allow us to deploy these systems at scale. A couple of practicalities. So um, clearly, um, I haven't talked about the details and the difficulties or the challenges in actually training. Oh, there was a question. Yeah. Quick question. So the adjacency matrix is updated at every time step, or? So at training time, yes. OK. Yes, so that's what we use at training time. At runtime, we don't know what it is. We just we receive whatever messages we receive, we aggregate them, multiply them by the tensors we trained, and that's it. Okay, and another question, because you mentioned that um, robot A received three inputs, yep. but in the diagram you only had uh, B and C, so. So it receives um, information from its full um, neighborhood, it receives its own, it, it, aggra it uses ah, okay. its own encoding, and everything that comes from the one hop neighborhood is first summed and then, and then okay. multiplied because you have to you have invariance of the size of the input. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's why you have to sum them first. Yeah. Sorry, I have another question. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> do you have to define the K uh, by hand? So it's a, it's this is a practical um, part of the uh, so it's a practicality. If your real world system allows you to do two hop communication, then that is what you're going to train with. If your real world system says you're only doing one hop communication, you set K to one. So this is modeled on a real world system because you're going to be running them at runtime with whatever um, setup you have, right? 
So for example, if I'm running an, an Amazon warehouse, I want my robots to be talking to each other, and I know that my robots will only be integrating messages from a one-hop communication neighborhood, then I set K to one, and I train with K to one. Okay, um, so my understanding is that the graph tells you you communicate to whoever is close to you, and that gives you the observation. And then they pass the coordinates, probably the X and Ys of, no? They don't know their positions. Yeah, uh, and actually, okay. there's that's an interesting point you're you're making because if positioning, so I'm sure the the, the speaker on GraphNets will say more about this. But as soon as you start adding absolute information, um, these systems don't generalize anymore, because you're like telling if you're at position X equals this and Y equals that, you take that action. But actually, you don't want that kind of decision making pattern to be dependent on a specific X Y position. You want it to be dependent on global structures instead. Right, so not including absolute positioning information is actually crucial to being able to generalize um, the performance. And that is what gives you the advantage because you can do this with a DB scan, right? You wouldn't need a graph. You just say whoever is close to me in an epsilon radius just talk to me. But I guess the beauty but, but that's of what's the... happening. Whoever is close to me talks to me. But at training time, you have to be able to model what information you're aggregating because you're mimicking the real world um, yeah. situation during training. Okay, if later you can give the title of the paper, I would like to read. Yes, yes, I, uh, do I, I have the references coming up. So this, that's the reference of the paper. It's on archive and uh, you can find a lot of this stuff on my website as well. All right, uh, sorry. so some, some, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, just quick question. Uh, do you have any requirements for synchronous or asynchronous communication? Super question. Yeah, that's a really, really good question. So. Um, the answer is actually mixed because you can train. So we train in lockstep and in a synchronous manner. Synchronous. In the real world, um, synchronicity doesn't really exist unless you enforce it with a lot of effort. And the problem there then that arises is that the scheme, the regime that your, your system was trained on does not correspond to how you're operating necessarily. So for example, I'm not going to be receiving messages from all my neighbors at the same time like it was modeled at training time. And hence, you have to start thinking about your machine learning um, architecture to account for this distribution shift. And I will talk about that in the last bit of my seminar. Hopefully I get there because I see I'm running out of time very quickly. Yeah. Uh, the, um, the robots, yeah. the, the graph of the, of the robots keep changing. Is it yeah. possible to to implement uh, a, a temporal graph neural network instead of, of... So this is all time varying. So we make no assumptions on, um, on the graph being static. So during train time, at every time step, the adjacency matrix is changing. Mm -hmm. So the graph is a time varying graph. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'll move on a little bit, but, but happy to take more questions also during the break in case um, a lot comes up. Um, a couple of practicalities. Um, so data set generation and training, well, what we did in this particular case is we generated 30,000 random cases where we generate start and end configurations. And we, for each case, we generate an optimal solution through an expert solver, wherein we only consider solutions that can be generated within our given timeout. So in this particular case, it was um, 300 seconds, because there are many instances that even CBS um, has trouble solving within that time. Um, at train time, um, we do something interesting that actually really helped us boost the performance. So some of you might be familiar with Dagger. Um, we, do, we, we leverage that idea to do something slightly um, similar in our case. So if we look at, um, so on the left-hand side, you can see how we update our parameters. And on the right-hand side, you can see how we're doing what we're calling data augmentation. So during training, we will note when our policy is actually not able, the policy that we currently have is actually not able to solve a given example. And what we then do is we take that example, run the expert solver on that particular example again, and add that to our data set during train time. 
So this idea of data augmentation really helps us improve our policy and, and, and kind of smoothen out the things that it's not learning adequately during train time and really helps boost performance. Because clearly when you're dealing with combinatorial type problems as we're doing here, there are a lot of corner cases and scenarios that you want to present to your, um, um, uh, to your model so that it generalizes better um, to these kinds of things um, at runtime. Okay, so um, a bit of a, uh, that was a bit of a quick overview of, of this um, piece of work, but I wanna move on um, to the case where uh, we, well, what we do when we don't actually have an expert solver available to us or when we don't want to use an expert solver. And um, what many um, are doing in, uh, in this particular case is then saying, well, we're gonna try to leverage reinforcement learning instead because it only requires us to be able to specify a reward function without necessarily having to generate the full um, objective and finding a solver that can produce the data for us to copy. Um, the problem with reinforcement learning, however, is um, that if you have a system where rewards are very sparse, you need to find a way of getting around that. Um, and if you think about this multi-agent pathfinding problem, it would be, it's not trivial thinking about how to formulate this within a reinforcement learning um, um, paradigm because the solution is given to us or success is given to us when the robots are at their goals and anything before that we don't know if it's good or bad we can't necessarily we can't even function on the on the assumption that closer to the goal is necessarily better because sometimes robots have to make detours in order to avoid deadlock or live lock situations so shaping a reward for the pathfinding problem in this joint um, combinatorial space is very tricky so what do we do? Um, in this case here, um, we, we designed um, a very simple um, reinforcement learning um, algorithm that got around this reward sparsity problem by doing something very simple. So what we said here is we're not going to deal with communication. We're going to act within um, a local um, frame of uh, field of view and communication free. Um, the, the only assumption we're making is that agents can observe agents and they can observe obstacles. And when they observe agents, they're actually treating them as moving obstacles. Now, based on that, they're going to make a decision of where to move. And they have a rough idea of where they're heading. And how are we going to now train them, given that we have this information? So the idea here was basically to say, well, we're not going to use an expert solver, but we're going to use what we're calling global guidance. So at train time, we're going to say robots know where they have to go. And this path is going to be given to us through a straightforward solver in the single agent domain. So say A star, which you can, which you can plan for very efficiently if you're, if you're only solving it for a single agent. And they're then going to use this path, which is given to us through some um, optimal search algorithm. Um, to try to stay on it. So this global guidance path will tell them at every step that you're on the path, you're going to get a reward. And if you um, um, then stay on it and reach your goal, you're going to get an even bigger reward. Now, the key is that you want your robots to be able to avoid each other. And the problem with that is if they're not rewarded for ro avoiding other robots, they will never leave their, their paths. So what we said is, well, what we're going to do is we're going to allow the robots to deviate from their global paths. But when they rejoin their globally optimal path, they will reap the rewards as if they had stayed on all the cells that they missed. Okay? And so this allows us to really densify the reward in a reinforcement learning set setting and generate behaviors that are able to avoid other robots, yet still lead robots to their final destinations. And so this is just a couple of snapshots of, of what you can do with this kind of policy. Um, a lot is going on here, I know, but it's just showing you qualitatively when we juxtapose um, our solution with global and local replanning strategies, qualitatively, we're doing really well. We're actually, in this particular case, we're actually reaching our goals quicker. Um, and there are a couple more movies that um, compare this to optimal solvers, so hierarchical cooperative A-star um, and um, some other benchmarks that show um, how this policy runs really well in practice. And if we look at it from a quantitative point of view, what's really interesting is, um, so our solution is the red line and the red histogram. And in both plots, what you can see is that the only solutions that actually do better than ours, so on the left plot, it would be the histograms that are closer to zero, or on this plot here, it would be the ones with the steeper curve, right? Because that's basically equivalent to success rate. 
The only solutions that are actually better than ours are solutions that are exploiting centralized information. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to speed through um, a couple of more um, topics because they're really interesting. Um, one other thing that we were really interested in doing is seeing if we could train communication strategies through reinforcement learning paradigm. So this example here shows you how we wanted to deploy a multi-agent system to cover an area as quickly as possible. Now, if you do this in convex area and convex um, shaped environments where you have obstacles um, that have um, um, nooks and, um, and protruding elements, in a distributed um, setting, this is again an NP-hard problem that you cannot solve um, tractably in real time. So again, very interesting for machine learning to try to tackle this problem, especially from a decentralized point of view. And so what we do here is we design a reward that tells the robots that every time they cover a new cell and they communicate to their robots such that every other robot is covering a new cell at every time step, you're reaping a reward. Um, and we look at this in these two different settings, so the co convex coverage and also the setting where robots are supposed to cover only what is in the right-hand side of this um, scheme. So the formalities in the top you will be familiar with. So are, those are the same three um, functions that we're trying to learn. So local encoding, communication function, and action policy. Um, and the only thing that is different is how we're optimizing the policy in this particular case. We're using a policy gradient to update, update our parameters um, because we're using reinforcement learning and we're given a reward signal. And the result of this is that our agents learn to communicate to each other relevant information that allows them to distribute very efficiently in this realm. So all that the agents are seeing is their local field of view and they know roughly where they have been because that's their local, their local visibility of their local traces or their local tracks. And that is what they communicate to the other agents. And that allows them to coordinate in such a way that coverage is ex extremely effective. All right, I do wanna spend a few minutes talking about research frontiers um, and tools um, because it points to a really, um, couple of really exciting um, areas. Yep. Is there a reason why um, the, in the um, uh, situation which was divided with the hole in the middle, the second scenario you had on the left-hand side, um, the robots seem to want to be on the same side? Is that, a, is that the next one, yeah, which popped up? Because it seemed to be much more efficient if only one robot was to fill the remaining hole. Um, I wonder if this, if this is a behavior that they all want to be on the same side is, um, is So that, that one there? This one on the, on the left, on yeah. The left, yeah, they're rewarded for covering the right side only. Oh, the right side is the one they want to cover. Okay, so yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was explicitly designed that way because we did a follow-up experiment that, um, if I have time, I will talk about as well, that exploits that structure. So here Understood. we explicitly wanted them to cover only on the right-hand side. Yeah. Okay, I missed that. Thanks. Yeah, sorry. All right. So a few things that we have to deal with um, when using machine learning for robotics in general or multi-agent systems or multi-robot systems um, are, are the following. So sim to real. Uh, I don't know if, if any of you are familiar with that, but that's the problem of what happens when you train a policy in simulation, but then you deploy it onto a real world system and the, distrib the distributions that your system sees in the real world do not correspond to what it encountered during training time. And that can lead to unexpected behaviors, and this is the problem that SimTorial tries to deal with. Um, interpretability. Um, so if you're using black box policies on real world systems, you clearly want to know what is going on because you might want to provide guarantees. This is especially relevant when you're deploying robots in the vicinity of humans or other um, safety critical systems. Uh, credit assignment, I'll say a few words about that, um, and I'll finish off by, by talking a little bit about more um, on resilience and a couple of tools that you can use to do these kinds of problems. So the reality gap um, is, is very simple. So if we look at, um, um, if we do this Gedanken experiment, if you think about um, the numbers that I've put on here, if we assume that we are collecting data on real robots, say at 20 hertz, then um, in order to gain enough samples for training a relatively simple policy, say we need tens of millions of samples to gain 
to get our robot to do anything remotely useful, then this would be equivalent to running our thing for 100 million time steps, which leads to 57 days of real-time compute. Okay? So clearly, that is not tractable, because that would mean you deploy a robot into your lab, leave it there for a couple of months, and then afterwards, you know, fingers crossed and hope it learned something useful. Um, and maybe it didn't, and then you start again from scratch. So this is why we have to rely on simulation to train uh, our policies. Um, clearly, in simulation, this takes much less time. Usually, it's a day or two, depending on what we're trying to do. But then, if, we're, if we haven't solved the sim to real problem, we, we, we hope that we can do zero shot, shot transfer, which basically means take your policy that you've trained in simulation, um, transfer it onto your robot without any fine tuning, and hope it does the same as what you observed in simulation. And in most cases, it does not, because what you see in simulation does not correspond to the real world. Um, if you have a lot of money, this is a solution that you can deploy. So some of you might be familiar with the, the robot farms that Google um, built um, up in uh, California. So they actually paralyze the training process by just building many, many, many robots of the same type, solving the same task. But for many people and for many real world problems, that's just not tractable and clearly doesn't scale and it clearly does not generalize. Okay? So that would be the ideal way, just paralyzing the training, but in the real world. It's very expensive. Another way of thinking about sim to real is taking your simulation and randomizing it. Randomizing it so much that you hope that what is in the real world is represented by what the robot saw in simulation. So here is a really good example. So in this particular study, um, the, just sorry, going back here, the authors wanted the robots to be able to manipulate this cube. And the robot was equipped with an overhead camera that saw the cube and told the robot the position of the cube so it could move it. Now, the problem with this was that the robot was starting to specialize on everything it saw. And so what um, the authors of that work had to do is that they had to randomize the color of the robot hand, because otherwise the robot would, would, um, would um, overlearn on specificities of the simulation example that are just not relevant. And so this technique is, is called domain randomization, where you start randomizing everything that you see in simulation so that when you deploy to the real world, um, those random, random occurrences have been trained for and dealt with during train time. But again, it does not work for all different kinds of things um, uh, because the real world, artifacts in the real world sometimes cannot be um, generated um, uh, it, through high fidelity, in high fidelity in simulation. This is um, an example that we did in my lab, and that speaks to the question that we had before about um, asynchronous communications. So especially when we're trying to train robots to solve difficult coordination problems in the real world, and this coordination relies on communication, you want to be sure that the communication patterns that were learned correspond to the communication patterns that are encountered in the real world. And the problem with that is that communication and simulation is often extremely simplified. So we're assuming a disk model, we're assuming lockstep, we're assuming synchronicity, we're assuming no delays, and all those things do not actually hold in the real world. And so in this study here, we actually show um, through an ablation of different um, communication paradigms how and whether or not performance degrades as we move to more and more realistic scenarios. Um, and for those of you who are interested, I invite you to look up the paper and you can look into more detail how we did the ablation um, to highly realistic um, communications paradigms. But the good news is that uh, we showed that the um, performance degradation is there, but it's very graceful. So what, um, and that's really important because this particular scenario is actually a make or break type scenario. So if the robots fail to coordinate, they, they won't be able to fit through the gap. And so we never encountered a complete failure. We just encountered a slightly less efficient um, maneuver to um, the destinations um, the, in this labeled assignment problem. One other thing to think about is um, fine tuning. So what you can do is think about training your system in simulation, deploying it onto the real world, and then fine tuning in the real world. Clearly, that initial example I showed you there is training in, in the real world from scratch, which you don't want to do because the robots, they start bumping into each other, and it's expensive, and robots break, and so on and so forth. And so um, this is something that um, some of my students did quite a while back, but they had the idea that we could do mixed reality training, right? So you definitely need to fine tune your policy on the actual platform because that's where the robot 
starts getting used to its um, dynamics, its motion profile, it, you know, is it moving on a carpet or on concrete? All those things matter when the robots are learning how to fine tune their motion strategies. But the inter-robot part, whether or not they have to avoid other um, robots or not, can be simulated, um, can be um, provided to the training process through a simulated input. So that's where we're doing a mixed reality. And so you can hardly see it here, but we actually have one real robot moving around there, and all the rest is simulated. And the robot is learning in this mixed setup so that it learns not to drive through obstacles and not to crash into the other robots while still getting used to its own body. And so after a couple hours of training, it has fine-tuned its policy, and you can see now it's become much more conservative in its motion. It's no longer arbitrarily changing lanes. It's avoiding the other robots, and it's also not crashing into the obstacles anymore. So this kind of mixed reality training setup is actually um, a really interesting way to think about how to solve the sim to real in a multi-robot domain. And you can see here the results showing before training, lots and lots of collisions, after training, um, less collisions, and a better uh, performance profile. All right, almost wrapping up. Um, I want to show you something that happens if in the very same example I showed you before, when we're trying to solve this cooperative coverage problem and we're learning communication, we have to be really careful with the incentives that we give our agents. Okay? Now, what happens when we separate the team in two and we freeze one of the teams and we let the other team continue learning its communication is actually really, really interesting. I'm showing you the plots here just to show you what happens. If we fix the policy of half of the agents and we continue training, say, one or two other agents, the, the performance of the agents whose policy has been fixed suddenly starts going down. And the performance of the policy of the agents who are still continuing to train starts going up. So this is in the scenario of the cooperative coverage. Can anybody tell me what is going on here before I actually reveal the movie to you? Anybody have an idea? So remember, the robots, they're learning how to cover the space as quickly as possible. And they're learning how to communicate with the other robots in order to achieve this. The ideal behavior is uniform distribution of the field, uniform coordination. But if I freeze half of the group and let the others train, that happens. Anybody know what's going on? Yeah. Yes. So I guess that what's happening is uh, you're shifting the environment. Uh, so basically, for the robots that are no longer learning, they learn to perform well in an environment which is no longer maybe yeah. exists, which yeah, doesn't yeah. exist yeah, anymore. Yeah, something along those lines, yeah. So think about it, you have two teams now, right? One team cannot learn anymore, and the other team is continuing to learn. And it's continuing to learn how to communicate to the other team. What is the reward? Does anybody remember what the reward is in this system? covering a new cell. So what is the team doing that is still continuing to learn? I guess they're relying on which cells they have visited so yeah. they can cover them themselves. You got it. So since they're learning to communicate still, they're now, they have learned that they can manipulate the other team because the other team cannot adapt anymore. And so we have one red, red agent here, you can see it on the right side, that has been allowed to continue learning its policy and it has learned that it only has to lie about its own local coverage to completely control the rest of the team so that it gains a large portion of the space for itself and it hence reaps a much greater reward. So this is just to show you that you have to be very careful about these um, learning paradigms and make sure that the incentives are correctly tuned. Um, this is the interpretability here, so post hoc um, interpretability of our scheme. We trained a model to reinterpret what the messages are, because they're latent, they're um, features, um, trained based on the assumption that the features represent global maps of what they have covered. And you can see how the non-lying agents, it corresponds to their local coverage, but for the lying agent, it does not correspond at all. So on the right-hand side, the blue agents send what corresponds to local coverage, and the red agent sends information which does not co correspond at all to, the, to their local coverage. So they have effectively learned how to lie about what, what cells they've already covered. Credit assignment, really important. Um, and I'm running out a little bit of time, so I'm going to just skim through this. The credit assignment problem is basically the problem of trying to understand 
how you distribute rewards in um, a training process where you only actually have one global reward. So if you have a car crash and you want to update the policies of all the cars in the system, where, which cars do you give, to which cars do you give a high reward and to which cars do you give a low reward? How do you distribute the reward of that time step so that the policies are updated um, adequately? So this is the credit assignment problem, and it's a very difficult problem to solve. Um, uh, it involves value factorization um, and so on and so forth, and there are quite a bit of, there's quite a bit of work in that area. And finally, what I want to talk about is tools. So um, as, I, as I mentioned to you previously, having good simulators is really, really key to being able to train these systems and generate interesting policies. But the problem is um, that um, there are few simulators that do it all for us. So robotic simulators often provide us with incredibly realistic emulation of many different things, say vision, maybe even tactile um, information. M many of you might be familiar with Mujoko, um, but they might not scale to the multi-agent um, regime, or they might not scale to three or four or, or three dimensions, or they might not be able to provide, say, accurate enough um, physics that can simulate what, how drones behave when they fly, and so on and so forth. Um, and in the, on, the, on the other hand side, multi-agent simulators are very effective at simulating um, scales, uh, large scales, uh, large number of agents, but do not have sufficient um, realism. So we recently put out a simulator um, that tries to bridge the gap between these things, so has some realism, but not too much, yet scales really, really nicely, interfaces really nicely with um, machine learning um, benchmarks um, and libraries that are out there, um, and we also very conveniently implemented quite a bunch of um, kind of benchmark, benchmark um, case studies that you can use to train um, your solutions on and see whether or not um, they solve them better than existing benchmark um, solutions. So um, here you can see quite a couple of them. So we have football in the middle. Um, discovery is actually quite interesting one because that requires, so you can see that the robots there, they, they have those spikes, that's their visibility range. Um, there you want the robots to, in, um, uh, in groups, discover targets. So a target only count is discovered if you have, say, a minimum number of N robots. So they have to coordinate to get close to a target. Um, then you have other problems such as balance, where you have several robots together that have to find how they have to um, organize themselves to balance um, certain objects. And so these are all kinds of problems that you can then um, use to try to devise your, your policies um, to solve them. We have a video that you can also watch online. Um, I will skip now because I know that coffee is waiting for us and just want to summarize my, my talk now. So um, it was a very quick overview of some of the research challenges that we have in the multi-agent domain. I hope that I convinced you that graph neural networks are a very interesting tool to use to solve these kinds of problems. Um, I hope that I also sensitized the topic of how we actually design the machine learning paradigms and what can go wrong if we don't design them carefully. And I hope I pointed out also a couple of the issues that we're trying to tackle as we, um, um, or the issues that are currently at the frontier of, of the field we're in right now. And there are many things that I'm excited about. So sim to real explainability, fairness, and resilience are a few of them. If any of these things resonate with you or you want to talk to me about them, please come see me. I'd be more um, than happy to, to discuss them with you. With thanks to the team, I presented a lot of the work that they've been developing the last um, few years. And I am going to conclude with my sponsor slide and be happy to take any additional questions now. Thank you. <laughs>